Hello, good morning, everyone. It's nice to see you here. Thanks for joining us. I'm Jenny Biggs with Aging Together, and hopefully you're all familiar with Aging Together, but we are a nonprofit out of Culpeper, and we work in the five-county region, um, offering resources and um, pulling together senior per professionals in the senior serving business and, and individuals, um, seniors for monthly meetings about the communities that we work in, which is Orange County, Culpeper, Madison, Rappahannock, and Fauquier County. And um, we invite you to join us anytime at one of our monthly meetings. And we offer all of these educational programs and work in partnership with these ladies that you see on your screen. So thank you everyone for being here. I'm going to turn it over to our co-host Lisa Dodson, um, who's worked with us putting these wonderful educational webinars together. Thank you, Lisa. Here you go. It's so good to be here this morning and I'm so excited to have Sarah with us this morning. So um, I met Sarah when she was the program director of Cornerstone Cares which is uh, a ministry for caregivers that's through Cornerstone Church in Warrington. She's a certified therapeutic recreation specialist with a background in activity programming for individuals living with dementia and other age-related disabilities. After receiving her master's in recreation therapy from Indiana University, Sarah took on the task of developing a caregiver ministry through uh, Cornerstone Church in Warrington. In this role, she utilizes her therapeutic um, recreation knowledge to help families engage their loved one at home with stimulating activities. Recently, Sarah has um, moved to a new position in Culpeper. She's uh, today with um, Culpeper um, uh, Baptist Church. They have a new program that they are starting, a new adult day center. Um, and so in early 2022, senior adults and their caregivers from Culpeper, Fauquier, Madison, Orange, and Rappahannock counties will have access to daytime support and engagement. The center will provide safe and engaging care for senior adults while their caregivers um, participate in respite. They will provide families the support they need to care for their loved one at home by creating an engaging care environment for senior adults to spend their days with purpose and enjoyment. A main highlight of the program is going to be um, intergenerational activities with children from the Child Care Development Center right there at Culpeper Baptist Church. Senior adults will have many opportunities to build relationships with children and people of all ages as they choose. So Sarah, it's ex we're so excited about your new endeavor with the Adult Day in Culpeper. It's so exciting to hear about that. And we're excited today to hear you share a little bit about summer activities and engagement. All right, I will go ahead and share my screen. Get us rolling here. Can everyone see the screen? Mm -hmm. Perfect. Well, um, thank you guys so much. It's just a joy to be here with you today. And my hope is that uh, this will be, be uh, spread and shared as a recording as well. Um, so even if you're tuning in later, I hope that this will be helpful to you. Uh, uh, again, I'm Sarah Amos, and um, I have a new email address, so if you would like to get in touch with me, uh, it's right there. It's samos at culpepperbaptist.org, um, and hopefully, you know, there'll be something that sparks your interest, and you'll want to connect with me a little bit more uh, after today. So today, we're going to talk about just some summer activities and engagement, and when I was thinking about it, I thought, you know, I could give you a lot of activities to do. I'm a recreation therapist, so it's, you know, in my wheelhouse, but um, I want to also just go through um, kind of the process of recreation therapy. So what is recreation therapy and why is it different than just doing activities with someone? Um, and I think there's a lot that we can glean from the approach um, with our, uh, our senior adults that uh, we can just approach activities differently in a way that's really going to be more beneficial for the people who are engaging in them. So um, let's go on to the next one. So uh, what is re a recreation therapist? Uh, not a lot of people know what that is. And so I figured I would just define it for you a little bit. So a recreation therapist is a professional who uses purposeful activities to improve or maintain the emotional, social, physical, cognitive, and spiritual well-being of individuals living with different disabilities. 
So recreation therapy can be used across the lifespan. We can use it with uh, young two-year-olds who might have uh, developmental delays. We, I did a uh, summer camp one summer. I worked at um, a summer camp for teens with disabilities. And so they were 19 to 22 year olds with um, Down syndrome, uh, some mental retardation and um, autism. And so we used leisure and recreation for them to um, build a sense of purpose and meaning for them. Um, and then I use it mostly now with senior adults uh, generally with cognitive impairments, um, because as we age and as we face some of the challenges of aging, leisure becomes an outlet for us to have purpose and to kind of fill our life with meaning. Um, so the goal of recreation therapy is not just to have fun, but um, it is to uh, have very specific goals, things like decreasing anxiety, depression, and stress, and then increasing or helping to maintain someone's overall function in, in the many domains of well-being. Um, and then also just bringing enjoyment. We all want to enjoy our lives. And especially if we're facing some cognitive impairments, um, we want to make sure that our life is still filled with joy and things that we can do, not limitations and things that we can't do. So it's not all just fun and games, although I do like to tell people I get to have fun for a living, but um, it is uh, very purposeful and intentional. So that's a little bit more about recreation therapy and what I do as a recreation therapist. Um, a little bit more about me. I am a certified therapeutic recreation specialist. So um, I've gone through, I uh, have a master's in this. And then I also went through the certification process um, through the board um, to make sure that, you know, I met all the standards for what a recreation therapist should be. Uh, I also spent about six years working at the Virginia Tech Adult Day Services. And in my time there, I worked with individuals with cognitive impairments, physical impairments, depression, anxiety, um, just kind of a myriad of challenges. Um, but in that, I really saw how a therapeutic environment with meaningful activities can actually really increase someone's well-being and quality of life. So I really enjoyed that. I was also, while I was there, a memory masterclass facilitator. I worked with a, um, a professor there at Tech to develop a six-week brain health program. And um, in this brain health program, we talk about um, the different lifestyle strategies we can implement to improve our brain health. So we are marketing it towards people who may be in the mild cognitive impairment range. So that's an actual diagnosis you can get from your doctor where they say you're, you're not performing as well as you should be for your age, but you don't have dementia. So people get that diagnosis and they go to the doctor and then the doctor says, okay, go home and come back in a year and we'll test you again. But in that year, there's so much that they could be doing to improve their brain health and brain function. So we talk about uh, six different lifestyle strategies they can implement. And a lot of it, it's actually just healthy, healthy lifestyle. Um, and, but it's um, making those things practical for people. Um, the cool thing about this is that I am um, actually going to be teaching it again this fall in Culpeper, um, hopefully in person. So if you are interested or you have any, um, you know, connections that might be interested in taking that, it's really for people who are just maybe concerned about some memory changes they're noticing. Maybe they had a loved one who did have dementia or a uh, 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 type of dementia or Alzheimer's, um, or maybe they are just, you know, just noticing some changes, uh, that is, uh, it's for them. You know, it's, it's really for all of us at every age, because the things we talk about, we should be implementing even at my age as well. So please uh, feel free to email me if you're interested or you know someone who might be interested in taking that class this fall. Uh, as Lisa mentioned, I uh, worked at Cornerstone Cares uh, before this, so I have a, a kind of a um, broader understanding now of what it looks like to be a caregiver. Um, I know I've met Danny and he has a great group of um, caregivers in Rappahannock and uh, there's just so much to learn from our caregivers, especially um, each situation is so different. So I really enjoyed that time. And then as Lisa mentioned, I'm also helping to open up an adult day center right now uh, in Culpeper. Uh, we're hoping to open early 2022 um, if all of our construction goes as planned and in time, um, but uh, we will actually be the only adult day center in all five counties uh, when we open up um, because some of the other centers are closing. So um, we are excited to have anyone <laughs> that is interested in coming, um, hopeful that everyone can participate that would like to. Um, and it will not just be respite or like a drop off center for seniors, but it's going to be a thriving program where they can really engage um, every day in something new and, um, you know, challenging their their brain and all that stuff. So it'll be full of good activities. 
Uh, so let's talk a little bit more about activities. So there's two types of activities. One is a diversional activity and the other is a therapeutic activity. So diversional activities are needed. I'll just start with that, <laughs> that it's not that they're bad. And sometimes, especially if we are a caregiver, um, we need to have our loved one be engaged in something so we can go do the laundry for five minutes or walk the dog or do the things that we need to do. So diversional activities are not bad, but they're not necessarily improving someone's quality of life. So we need to have a mix, especially if we're with someone all day long, there needs to be a good mix of both, um, but really focusing on those more therapeutic type activities. So diversional activities, they don't really have a purpose. They're kind of just filler. Um, so the intent of them is to entertain um, and not necessarily improve someone's quality of life. So this is sitting someone in front of a TV because you know um, the, their favorite Western is on and they enjoy that and it's okay, but it's really just for entertainment. It's not improving their function or quality of life. But a therapeutic activity is something that is purposeful. It's directed by one or more goals of care or things that we're trying to accomplish for their, their overall care. And it kind of is intended to bring about a change in behavior. It's really based on the individual. So um, not every activity is gonna hit every person the same way, um, but we want to make sure that, uh, so, so we want to make sure that each activity we do is really intentional for the person. So that's the difference between the two. Again, diversional are not bad, but we really have an opportunity as caregivers, professional or um, family caregivers to increase someone's quality of life by giving them uh, a meaningful or more therapeutic activity. So every activity has the potential to impact one or more of these areas, someone's physical health, um, someone's emotional health, their cognitive health, their social health and their spiritual um, health as well. So not every activity is gonna hit all of these different things, but there's an opportunity in every activity um, to think through how you could engage these different areas of someone's well-being. So for example, um, if I was gonna do an art activity, I might you know, pick, <laughs> pick a coloring page and some uh, colored pencils and put them in front of a, a senior adult and say, have fun, you know, um, and that that might be some physical, they do some fine motor, it would be some cognitive because they'd have to maybe color in the lines, choose colors, things like that. Um, but there's ways to increase the um, their well-being through that by the way we do the activity. So instead of just putting it in front of them, I might um, ask them, hey, I'm going to do some coloring today. Would you like to participate? So there's some social interaction of doing it together. And then I would say, what's something, uh, you know, today is, it's uh, August. What's something that makes you think of August? And so they might say, um, I think of the beach. So we would pick a color. I might pick a coloring page that reminded them of the beach or looked like the beach. So thinking that's kind of sparking that cognitive. They're having to remember something, maybe the emotional. And as we talk about, we can talk about times we went to the beach, things that made us happy about the beach, or um, maybe a time we had a bad experience at the beach or something like that, giving them an opportunity to kind of have emotional expression. We're talking, that's social. And then even spiritual too, there's a side of like connecting to a higher meaning. So through discussion, we can talk about, you know, what does the beach represent to you? Um, what's What's something that um, a time you went to the beach and you really had a powerful experience, something like that. Um, so the, there's the same activity. We're still just coloring, but we're doing it in a way and with an approach that's kind of hitting more of these areas of well-being. So um, in every activity, you want to think through all of these. How is this impacting the person's physical, emotional, cognitive, social, or spiritual health? Um, there's also an occupational um, uh, category of well-being, but I'm not an occupational therapist, um, but that has more to do with like our job and our roles and responsibilities. Um, and uh, occupational therapists can talk to you way more about that than I can. So I'll just leave that to them. So if you're having trouble getting your loved one or your senior adult, your participant, your client engaged, um, there's a lot you can consider. Um, it's hard to get someone engaged that does not want to be. Uh, I spent a lot of my time kind of putting on an act or, you know, putting on a performance just to get people motivated to want to do something um, that's good for them. Even if they know it's good for them, they don't always want to do it. But we need to consider things like the environment. Is this environment encouraging someone to participate or discouraging them? 
uh, especially people. Um, I've spent more time with caregivers in the home lately and seeing just how certain family members just set them off, you know, set the, set the senior adult off. They do not like them. They don't want to do anything with them, you know, or how other um, family members can kind of like a, a grandchild can spark this, um, this desire to participate and give back. So thinking through who's in the environment and then also what things are in the environment. Is it really loud? Is it really cold? Is it really something um, that might make someone not want to get up out of their chair or might make someone um, frustrated? Or, you know, if you're trying to have them uh, encouraging them to do art and the TV is like blaring in the background, it's going to be distracting. They're not going to be able to focus in. So we really want to consider the whole environment. And just a lot of times for me, that just looks like pausing and like taking note of what's in the environment and thinking through, would that encourage me to participate in this or probably not? Um, consider someone's mood and energy. Not every day is a good day for every activity, um, especially if they're feeling especially tired. Maybe we had a trip to the doctors that morning um, and they're not really wanting to get up and get out, but maybe there's other activities that are more passive, a little bit uh, calmer that might be engaging as well. So also consider time of day. <laughs> um, not everyone is bright and early, you know, a bright riser. And also not everyone likes to stay up late at night, but depending on the person, you know, they might have um, different energy or different desire to participate in different times of day. Um, consider people's patterns. So um, in the adult day setting, we always had uh, that one or two people who would always try and pay us for lunch, you know, at the end of at the end of lunch, because that's what they did. They're out in public. They're at a restaurant to them. To them, they were at a restaurant. and They're like, well, I, get, I better pay. I've paid my whole life. Who's who's just going to give me this food for free? So um, that's just a funny one. But thinking about people's patterns, if they were um, you know, if they worked a, a desk job and they like to, they usually sat all day, you know, getting them up and moving might be hard. Or if they worked a very active job, asking someone to sit down or sit for long periods of time might be hard for them. So knowing someone's history is actually really helpful to think through their patterns. Their motivations. Again, people motivate us. Um, sometimes certain topics motivate people. My favorite thing is to just learn how, like learn what gets people excited. Um, everyone had some area of expertise in their life or something that really got them in, invested. So sometimes it just takes time to think through uh, what those things are. Also, this is a really important one. Consider your body language. So um, I'm going to push this down a little bit. I tend to sit like this a lot. I sit with my arms crossed. <sighs> And it's usually because I'm cold, because I'm almost always cold. So that's a little bit of a challenge. But um, I've had to learn, especially in environments where an individual may be more agitated or frustrated, you need to open up your posture. You need to relax your hands, relax your shoulders, even bring your voice down, making sure that we're staying calm, everyone is talking okay, even if they're yelling at you or upset with you. Um, but also thinking um, just how we can in invite people with our hands and our open posture. Would you like to come do something with me? I would really love to spend time with you today. Um, thinking about how our body language is giving off um, certain attitudes, um, especially because if someone else is agitated, our, our my response usually at least is to become a little tense and agitated. I don't like to be yelled at or I don't like people frustrated with me, but taking a deep breath and um, opening up my body posture, lowering, lowering my tone of voice, things like that too are very helpful. Think about barriers to participation as well. So um, a lot of times people don't want to initiate activities, especially if they have, are experiencing um, some kind of cognitive impairment they're not good at initiating. So sometimes that's a huge barrier for participation. They need someone to set up the activity, to invite them to come to it. And sometimes they just need to be passive and observant for a little bit too. So um, sometimes people prefer to watch first and then they're more likely over time as you encourage them to be able to participate in something. So thinking about just things in the environment too, physical barriers, um, one thing that's always hard, we think about our care facilities that have um, beautiful co courtyards, but there's also that safety aspect too. And we're even in our new adult day services design, struggling with this. And so we want to keep people safe, but we also want them to have access to outdoors. Um, so how can we really create an environment that allows them to freely participate as they choose, um, but also is keeping them safe? So it's just kind of a, it's a trade-off all the time, but something to really consider. We want to promote autonomy and choice, no matter how small. So in every single activity, um, we want to um, give people the option. So are we going to make 
apple pie today or are we going to make a cherry pie? Are we going to um, play beanbag toss or are we going to play ladder golf today? Would you like to sit here and watch or would you like me to come to the table with you so we can participate? Um, giving people the option um, between different art supplies or even what kind of snack they have, um, it really empowers people to want to um, enjoy and um, participate in the environment when they feel like they have some sense of choice and autonomy. Um, and then also just like I said earlier, thinking about our communication, our tone of voice, are we invitational or are we demanding? So you need to come and do exercise because it's PT, it's, it's four o'clock, it's PT time, and this is your time to do PT. Um, I wouldn't want to be told that unless, I mean, unless I was a little scared of the person, but it's different than you know what time it is? It's four o'clock. And you know what? Every day at four, our physical therapist is in the house. You know, your doctor said that it's really important for you to be able to um, get up and move. And I think this would be a great time for you to come exercise. Would you be willing to do that? So it's all in how we approach. Um, and, and really the takeaway from all of this, which is a lot, is just to, it's all about how you ask. It's all about the ask um, and the way we approach an activity, the way we approach someone to engage in something. So where to start? Um, we really want to think about when we're, we're creating activities for someone or um, kind of thinking through how we can engage someone. Think about someone's life pursuits. What were their hobbies? What were they excited about? What career did they have? What interest did they have? And maybe you have an avid golfer and obviously you can't go golfing again, but there's ways you can do mini golf or um, you can ask them about their um, years as, um, uh, as a golfer and things that they really enjoyed about that. We had a, a senior adult at the adult day who was a poet. He had been this really cool diplomat, like he'd been to so many countries. So he loved to tell us about that. But one of his favorite things for him us to do was just sit with him because he was much more passive. He had a, a lot of low energy challenges. Um, but his favorite thing for us to do was just sit with him and read him his poetry, like read his poetry to him. And it was beautiful because it was an opportunity for him to reflect on life and these uh, poems were things that were really powerful for him and um, they brought back very powerful memories. And so we could ask him about those. Um, so thinking about their interests, their relationships that they had in their past, you know, people love to talk about their family. Sometimes they don't. So maybe, you know, being careful with that too, because sometimes family relationships can be challenging as well. And also traits and characteristics, thinking about Maybe they're not a social butterfly and they're not going to initiate a conversation, but you know they might really get along with another person or a resident or um, a neighbor. Maybe you can kind of facilitate that for them and knowing that they have a hard time initiating, but once they kind of can get talking, it'll be a lot easier. We also want to take a strengths-based approach. So that means looking at a person and saying, what can you do? Where can we start? What are you able to do? A lot of times, especially in the adult day setting, people come in and the caregivers will say, well, they used to be this professor and they did this and this and this, and they can't do any of that anymore. But our job, um, and especially as we're caring for someone, is to say, maybe you can't do what you used to do, but what can you do? So what are your strengths and how can we pull those out and maintain those as long as possible? Also the least restrictive environment, that just means that we only do what is necessary to care and help someone. For example, in an activity, if you're doing a craft and um, Mr. Jones is really creative and he likes, he's great with pasting and, and cut, um, he's great with pasting things and coloring things. Um, he has a great creative eye, but he struggles with one thing and that is just that he can't use scissors anymore. His fine motor skills have, have declined. So what I might do is, you know, he might be sitting there frustrated because we've asked him to cut something out and he can't start until it gets cut out. So I would say, um, Mr. Jones, uh, you know, what's going on? And he might say, well, I can't, I can't do this. Well, I'd say, how about I get started for you and I will cut it out and then you can show me where you want, uh, where you want to put the rest of it on. Um, so really thinking through, talking through with someone, doing the least necessary, um, like the least amount of help, but giving them the most amount of opportunity to do it for themselves, um, but just helping them kind of overcome some of those smaller barriers. And then we always want to make sure that every activity, every supply, every piece of something we bring into an environment and present to a senior adult is age appropriate. Um, I really strongly recommend against crayons because those are like an icon of childhood. Um, also thinking through games and stuff. Um, sometimes it can be a fine line, uh, but just really making sure 
even the way we talk to a person is age appropriate. So all of this is really person-centered care is something that we really are focusing on in the field of senior adult care is how can we um, make our care person-centered for uh, and really focused on the person and make it uh, make them part of the process of care rather than saying, well, this is what we do here at the center. We do art on Tuesdays at 10 and you will do art on Tuesdays at 10. Um, and they hate art, you know, that's not fair to them because uh, then, you know, that's not giving them options to participate in something else or participate in the way that they would like to. So thinking through all those things is important. Um, this is a uh, process that we use in recreation therapy called the A-PI process. And the reason I put it in is because when we are doing activities for our loved one at home, when we are doing activities for our, um, our residents in a care facility or participants at the adult day center, um, we always need to be using this process. So first assessing the person. And that's kind of what we talked about just in the last couple of slides is who is this person? What are their challenges? What are their strengths? Um, what is the situation? What are we trying to accomplish? We're trying to um, increase their social interaction. We're trying to increase positive expression. We're trying to decrease um, uh, depression or anxiety for them. So kind of assessing the situation, um, assessing the person and the environment, and then we go into planning. So given all the information we know, we're trying to increase social interaction. So we might plan an activity um, that we know our, our participant or resident likes to do. And then we would say, maybe I can invite um, Mr. Jones to come and sit with him or to, to also do it. And so thinking about how can you increase their social interaction um, by making a plan and then you implement it, you try it, uh, you just do it, do what you plan to do. And then you evaluate, how did it go? What went well, what did not go well? Maybe it is a Tuesday after a doctor's appointment and Mr. Jones did not want to talk to anybody and it was just a grumpy experience, but we're going to evaluate that. Maybe we try on Wednesday when he's a little bit more fresh. So, and then you go back all the way to the assessment process again. So assessing the situation, planning again, implementing. So it's really, um, it's nothing too new. It's kind of a, just a logical way to process, but all of this is to say that activities are a constantly um, evolving and changing uh, thing. And you have to really be constantly assessing and evaluating how it's going to know how to provide the best care, the best activities, the best engagement for um, the person. I love that slide, Sarah. Yeah. I'm so glad. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Ellen would appreciate that. She's also a rec therapist, so she would know that. Oh. <laughs> Um, so these are just some ideas, uh, of, I came up with, again, I could come up with a lot of ideas for activities, but these are just some I thought of, especially for the summertime. So my question for you guys is if you could go on a vacation to any place this summer, where would it be? Or where would you go? Oh, so many places. <laughs> <laughs> Florida. Florida. I okay. get on a plane. That's good. Danny, how about you? Where would you go? he's still here or Denise how about you yeah Denise um I go on a cruise Ooh, where would you go on a cruise um probably Greece Ooh, mm -hmm. that's awesome I've always wanted to go there that's awesome Lisa how about uh, you oh no Danny uh, are you there? I hear you uh, yeah I didn't know how to unmute I figured it. <laughs> um well I've been uh I've been to France, Florida, and Minnesota, so I would go home. <laughs> I'd oh, stay home. <laughs> nice. Okay, that is that I'm is done. <laughs> that's fair. Oh man, man, please. Oh man, that's so good. Uh, Lisa, how about you? I would probably do some kind of a cross country thing and go to Montana and Utah and Arizona and you know just drive, do a circuit kind of a thing. That's awesome. I like it. Okay. All right. So I'm now a little jealous that we're not going on these vacations. I'm a little sad. <laughs> um, so I think for me, if I were to go anywhere, just because I haven't been in a little while and because it's an easy vacation is I would like to go to the beach myself. Um, so maybe, especially now we can't, 
travel, um, especially with all the things that are happening and the uncertainty of the months to come. Um, but there are ways to help people kind of travel in our minds. And so one activity would be to do a take home, take a home vacation, just take a vacation at home um, for an afternoon or for an hour or for even 15 minutes. Um, sometimes that can just be a refreshing reset, especially when we've been in our house for a really long time. So you might go to the store and um, I might find a scented candle that reminds me of the beach smells like white sands or sunscreen even. Um, I would probably pull out the blanket I have that um, I've used at the beach every year, pull out some beach chairs or maybe borrow them from a neighbor. Um, think about music. I always think country music at the beach for some reason. I guess I'm always going with people who love country music. So that's why that's what comes to mind for me. Um, I would maybe find an umbrella. And then, um, so if I was going to do this with a, a senior adult, I might say like, when you think of the beach, what is, what do you think of? What do you taste? Like what food comes to mind when you think of the beach? And they might say like, um, oh, mine is always a uh, chocolate vanilla twist cone with sprinkles. On it. That's mine. So I would probably yeah. maybe go get that. Like I would go try and see if I could locate, which I've had many of those this summer. So they're easy to find. I will tell you. Um, and I might try and find something fun, like a little mist or spray bottle, one of those little fans that mists you. Cause you think about like the ocean kind of misting you a little bit. And then think of things like I might wear at the beach, like hat and sunglasses. So I'd collect all of these supplies and create maybe on the front porch, a little beach vacation for the senior adult and I to do, or um, for, for me to do with someone else. Um, and then the purpose, so the purpose of this is really to increase positive emotions and cognitive engagement to stimulate the senses. So scent, uh, the scent um, is really closely, uh, um, connected to our memory. So since, I don't know if you've ever smelled something and you're like, that reminds me of my fifth birthday party for some reason, you know, or like there's sometimes I'll go into school, like elementary schools and I'll smell them. And I'm just like, I should remember all the years of being in elementary school now. Mm -hmm. um, so scent uh, and, and then also just the sensory, the feel of the blanket or the sound of the music, the taste of the ice cream is kind of uh, giving you this experience where you're not at the beach, but you're getting to experience what it's like to be at the beach. And so approaches would be to kind of set up the scene um, in a place that would be comfortable for your loved one or the participant to enjoy. Um, and, you know, maybe write them a little invitation, like meet me at the beach, um, you know, meet me at the beach at 4 p.m. today. We're taking a trip to the beach and kind of talk it up, get them excited. Um, another option would be maybe it's hard to relocate the person or they have physical challenges that make it hard to get out of bed, bring all of it to them. You know, there's no reason that they shouldn't participate just because they have uh, challenges getting up and out. So this is just such an awesome time. And then when you're there, talk about when, when, what do you remember about the beach? What smells do you remember? What um, sounds can you remember about the beach? Uh, what was the time you went there and you really enjoyed it? So it's bringing up all those reminiscing opportunities. Um, you can even invite a loved one to come enjoy it with you too, to kind of create some new memories. So that's an easy one. Another one kind of going along in the same vein is vacation reminiscing. So um, you can find old photo albums, trip mementos, uh, maybe even locate a family member that might've been on a vacation with this person and um, maybe get some colored pencils and uh, paper or um, some pictures that kind of remind you of the vacation too. And the purpose of this would be to increase positive emotional expression um, increase cognitive engagement and promote, um, oops, sorry, uh, promote well-being through shared positive experiences. So basically you would ask them, what was the favorite, what's your favorite vacation that we've taken as a family? Or, um, you know, you and our son used to go on a lot of trips together. What was your favorite part of that? Then kind of find some of those mementos, those photos, photos to really prompt remembering and recall of that time. And maybe just a person say like, I found these, these, these photos. I pulled out this photo book earlier today. Can you tell me about this picture right here? And just point to one, give them, give them an opportunity to express um, and tell you more about it. And then kind of take it a step further and say, what smells, sounds, images, like what comes to mind when you think of our time together there? What, what do you really remember? What sticks out to you? It's giving them a lot of opportunities to reminisce, um, to kind of relive some of the positive experiences you might've had maybe even negative experiences too, but you know, maybe to laugh about those as well. And then just asking them things like, what did it feel like to be there? What did it feel like to be on top of that mountain? Or what did it feel like to stand in the middle of Greece and um, you know, see the beautiful water? 
um, just giving them an opportunity to relive those positive experiences, even though they may not be able to go do those things anymore. So it's kind of just a really good mental escape. Um, and then the last one I thought of was, uh, I love this idea. I, I learned it from our music therapist at, at Virginia Tech. She did uh, something called Open Studio. So um, we basically, every Friday, uh, which is kind of a hard day for everyone because the staff is tired and the participants are tired, um, we would do this thing called Open Studio where she would put on a playlist. Um, I think she used something called The Secret Garden and it's on Spotify. It's an artist. Um, and she would, it's kind of, uh, reflective music. It's really pretty. Uh, and then she would go around with a cart of different art supplies, different types of paper, different types of um, uh, colored pencils or um, watercolors. And she would just let the participants choose what they wanted to use. And um, sometimes she would have, to, we would have to kind of refine down the choices. So maybe they couldn't choose between colored pencils or watercolors. That was an overwhelming choice, but we'd say, do you want the red colored pencil or the green colored pencil to start? And so kind of giving them um, the opportunity. And then we would create this studio that was very creative. The environment was uh, conducive to expression because it was quiet. We had this good music on, it was calm for a Friday afternoon and everyone had everything they needed in front of them to participate in art, to express themselves. So um, other things you could do is like pick a photo inspiration. Um, so you might pick um, a picture of, you know, the, the person's family vacation, or you might pick uh, pictures of summer fruits. That's something that I love to think about in the summertime is uh, delicious peaches and um, going to the farm to pick things. Um, so you could put some pictures for inspiration for people. Um, and the whole purpose of this is to promote cognitive engagement, emotional expression, and creativity, and kind of to increase and maintain their motor function. So they're using a lot of fine motor in this, um, uh, in, in this particular activity. Um, and there's also some social aspect of it too, because we would give them a time to just express themselves, to paint, draw, color, whatever it looked like. And you'd be amazed at some of the things that they came up with. It was just, it was really beautiful. Um, and then at the end, we would say, we would hold up each person's piece and say, um, you know, Mr. Jones, tell me about this. And, you know, maybe there was a story that they could connect to it. Maybe there was, um, you know, an, an emotion that they were experiencing and maybe they would just be like, well, that's it. And you're like, okay, that's all you want to share. That's your, that's your choice as well too. But it gives them an opportunity to connect with one another in a meaningful way as well. So approaches would just be to set up all the materials in advance. Um, maybe we had a lot of people who didn't want to do it at first, but we would sit them next to someone who was doing it. Or if I was at home with someone by myself, I might set up materials for both of us um, let them choose what they want to use. Um, and if they said, I don't really want to participate, I'd say, that's okay. Why don't you just, would you just come and sit with me while I do it? And you'd be surprised that as you're doing it and you're um, engaging in it, someone else might kind of pick up on that and want to do it themselves. So that's kind of modeling and what we call parallel activity is you're each working on your own thing, but you're doing it together. And those are pretty positive interactions most times. Um, again, giving the appropriate number of material choices, not overwhelming people with things. Um, and then one of the biggest strategies we found that was awesome is if you look at a white piece of paper, I myself get overwhelmed with like, what am I supposed to put on this? Like, it's just this big white blank square and I don't know what to do. So we would take a bowl, turn it over and draw a circle for them and say, could you put some color in that circle? And it worked almost every time, you know, cause they were like, oh, I'll just, and then they would pick the color they want and you'd be amazed at what came out of that. So um, that's a good strategy, especially with, especially with individuals who don't like to initiate or um, who have cognitive impairment as well. And then again, just giving them opportunities to say, tell me more about this. What, what is this? What, what inspired you here? Um, in general, the, the line, tell me more about this or tell me more about that is one of the ones I use the most uh, working with individuals with dementia is because they might be um, willing to share just little pieces, but if you say like, well, tell me more about that, then they have to have this open-ended like, oh, I have to come up with something to say. You know, I can't just say yes or no answers in that too. So that's a good one. And then um, I also just thought of some good other activity ideas to incorporate in daily life. Um, some fun ones that I've found as a recreation therapist. So there's, music is so huge. Music listening is so important. Uh, people really enjoy listening to music and especially if we find the types of music they enjoy. But you can also do ones, I've seen a fun activity where 
uh, someone would play different types of music or music videos, and then they would have everyone rate them like one out of 10 or one out of five. And so everyone kind of got to give their own opinion on the music because uh, music kind of inspires a certain or incites a certain reaction in us. Um, and there's some that we really like, some that we're not as big of a fan of. So that was fun. There's a really cool book called You Be the Judge. I thought this was the coolest thing. Um, so it's uh, court cases around, I think, the U.S., and um, they're kind of these outlandish court cases. And so they'll give you the court case and then they say like, what do you think happened? Or what would you, what judgment would you have made? And it's just super fun. It gets people um, excited. And especially if we have those senior adults who like to judge things, it's just as right up their alley. So they're, they're all about giving you their opinion on that. So that's a fun one. Um, if a lot of this is too complex for an individual and you do need something stimulating for them, but they may not be able to express themselves or follow directions, um, multiple directions, things just like using game cards or beads to sort. That can be a great activity for someone who just um, maybe is agitated or just needs something to do with their hands. That's a good one. Uh, we use TheraPutty a lot, which is uh, different. It's almost like Silly Putty, but it's got different strengths. So some of it's really um, kind of thicker and some of it's smoother so they can play with it in their hands it's a great sensory thing you can talk while you do it um, and sometimes it just helps calm people down gives them something to do with their their hands um, there for higher functioning individuals there's uh, a lot of good brain games called um, there's one called set which um, has to do with patterns and numbers it's here in the corner there's one called coggy and there's one called rush hour those three are really good for stimulating the mind um, which is good um, and then just things like baking and cooking, that is a great opportunity for reminiscing for, um, there's cognitive stimulation because you have to measure, there's motor because you have to dump or stir, um, and it just opens up a lot of opportunities. People love to talk about food, and food is a very, um, for most people, is a very meaningful experience, so getting to make food with someone is important, but then also getting to talk about what it reminds us of is, is good too. And then just Recently, I was in a, a family's home and they had bought this little ball toss um, and she was having a hard time getting her husband active, but he loved that ball toss. Like we played for an hour together because he could just do it from his chair and he was really lo loving, like just tossing the balls in this little bucket. So um, again, picking things that are age appropriate, but um, you know, those are easy ones to implement or just kind of have around for people who might not want to get up and take a walk, but they're more willing to do something active from their chair. And then always just promoting opportunities for people to uh, review their life, things that were important to them. Um, this is a season of life as we age um, our senior years, our times of reflection and giving back. Um, and this is what I, I think I'm most excited about with our intergenerational, um, our center is just the intergenerational opportunities for senior adults who may not feel purposeful or valuable um, to share about their life with a little kid um, who is, just wants to learn something. And, and the kids to learn from seniors and also not be maybe so afraid of seniors or, or challenges or disabilities too. So there's a lot of opportunities there. Any questions or comments? Um, this is how you can contact me now. This is my new um, email address. And if you're interested in the Adult Day Center or the Memory Masterclass uh, as well, anything, or you just wanna talk more about activities, you're welcome to, to connect with me, so. This is great, Sarah. Thank you so much. I mean, it was just, you're so compassionate about your work and it just, just it. shows and Culpeper Baptist Church is so lucky to have you. It's gonna be wonderful. Can't wait for that opening. Thank you. Well done. Thanks, Sarah. Yes, thanks, Danny. Glad you could get on. Questions? Oh, yeah, a quick question. It's Denise. This, Sarah, was so powerful. Um, the impact, just small changes in your verbiage and things. And so I'm in a community now and I want, I would like for my staff, all of our staff to see this. When, when is a presentation going to be available to, to view? <laughs> well, we hopefully as long as I can get the recording, um, we'll put it up on the website. So you, the best thing is to always just check the okay. website cool. because we put stuff up as, um, you know, we can make it happen. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I'm so but glad. With the, what about the slides? Would that be okay? Um, yeah, that's fine. You're, you're welcome to, to pass them on. I'll, I'll give them, uh, I'll give them to you today. I'll email them. To oh, you. that would be great. Thanks. Thanks. Anyone else have Thank questions? You. 
Yes, thank you. Danny, Lisa, any other comments? No, it was a great uh, presentation. Well, I, I, I think uh, a lot of folks at Rapid Home would enjoy this presentation. So mm, good I, point. I, yes. Let me know when it's available. That'd be wonderful. Okay. Yes, then, I'll do that. Yeah, I'm always happy to answer questions or if or if there is a time to come in person too. I, I have time at the moment <laughs> until the center opens. I'm a little bit more free, but and um, that's January. I will. Hoping. I'm going to be reaching out to you. Yeah. For that. <laughs> um, yes, January is the hope. Uh, we'll see what happens. The hope and prayer for sure. Uh, that over. Right. Time. And isn't there an event that that Aging Together is doing with the yes. day? Um, yeah, I think yeah, so. Tell so, about that. I'm trying. Yeah. I'm yeah. So in uh, we have a couple things on the books. One is in April we'll be doing a big opening uh, intergenerational event with Aging Together. Um, we were really excited to receive funds from the Better Together grant, um, and we're going to be able to do some really cool stuff there. So that's April, nice. so it'll be a little bit after we open. Um, before that, uh, we have uh, what we're calling senior engagement groups, which will be every Monday from September to mid-December um, at 10 a.m., and um, it's just going to be doing these things for our seniors in the community. So anyone who's been isolated, whether or not they have maybe a cognitive impairment or whether or not they're ready for the adult day center, um, they're welcome to come and just engage with us. And stop by. You're saying in yeah, person. Yeah. So it's kind of yeah. It's like an in-person um, little taste of what adult day will be oh, like every I day. See. Drop, yeah. drop uh, when when will those be? Um, they're going to be September. They won't start. Uh, I think September thirteenth. I think the sixth was Labor Day, so the week after Labor Day. Um, and I will have uh, flyers for that very soon. I'm just kind of coordinating some volunteers at the moment, but. Um, it's for anyone, it'll be at the church at Culpeper. Um, so it might be a little drive mm -hmm. from Rappahannock, but, um, it's, it'll just be an hour long opportunity for seniors to come and and participate in meaningful activities together. So, mm -hmm. oh, that sounds great. Yeah. So every Monday at 10 AM is the time. Okay. And then I just want to, oh, go ahead, Danny. Do you have another no, question? I just said, great. That's good. Okay, and I just wanted to remind everybody that we have one more uh, webinar with our summer series um, coming up August 24th at 10 a.m. And that one is with uh, Sue Van Tyne, who lives in Fauquier County area. She's a community case manager, and she's going to talk about care options and building a care team. So I hope you'll just check our website because we're posting all of our stuff that we're doing. We've got um, a big, in September, we've got uh, what we're calling a lunch and learn with the triad program about scams and frauds and staying safe for seniors. That's gonna begin on September 2nd. It'll be like a six or seven lunch and learn programs that we're gonna be doing. So um, check us out, agingtogether.org. And thank you so much for being here. And Sarah, thank you. Wonderful thank you so presentation. We'll put that up as soon as we can. Thanks for joining, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you, Sarah. Bye-bye. See you later. Bye-bye. Thanks, Sarah. Bye. Yes, bye-bye. Thanks. <laughs> that was great. Yeah.